When thinking about the future, one of my greatest fears is how we are communicating with one another. And more specifically, what are we doing to teach the next generation about conflict and conflict resolution? What I'm seeing online often is that people are able to block one another or unfriend one another. And it's not really teaching us about building resiliency and um, working through conflict, which can teach us a lot about trust and intimacy and um, bring people closer together. So I'm going to share quickly about a conflict that I found myself in about 10 years ago. I survived it. I'm still here. And then also shift gears and talk about a framework that I use currently at my workplace. So um, about 10 years ago, I was in my first year of college, and a student tagged me on a Facebook post, making fun of another student who lived two doors down from me. And me being 18 and wanting so desperately to have a place where I belonged, I immediately liked that post and added my own comments of, that's hilarious, even though it really wasn't. And by the time I hopped in the shower and came back to my dorm room, five or six students were waiting outside of my room to have a little conversation about this Facebook uh, post. And um, I can still feel how embarrassed I am about that. And I tried to apologize then in the moment, and the student didn't really, didn't really want to hear that. And um, was really worried about how people would perceive me on campus. I even called my parents a couple of days later and said, you know, I, I better transfer. I need a clean slate with this, right? And um, instead, to make a long story short, I stayed on campus. We worked through it. I wouldn't say that we became best friends, but by second semester, we were in a place where she could really hear my full apology in a different way. And it really built up my resiliency to know that by going through that situation, we could have a little bit more trust and understanding of one another. So I want to talk about my workplace and how that connects to nonviolent communication, the topic of tonight. Um, I work at the MK Gandhi Institute for Nonviolence. It's a nonprofit here in Rochester, New York. And we focus on building a sustainable, just world for all. And that really means looking at how we are showing up with one another. And at our workplace, we talk about if we're having a conflict, that we might take it from text messaging and emailing to being in person so that we can see our facial cues, hear the tone of voice, being able to connect in a different way. And we also use a framework that's called um, nonviolent communication. And that was started by Marshall Rosenberg, an American psychologist here. Unfortunately, at this point, Marshall has passed away in 2015. But I wanted to share a short clip with you to, so that you could hear a little bit about his own work. refugee camp in uh, the Palestinian Authority and what all the crowd had to do was hear uh, from my interpreter that I was an American and a gentleman jumps up and screams at me, a murderer, and another one jumps up, assassin, and another one calls child killer. Uh, within an hour the guy that called me a murderer invites me to a Ramadan dinner at his house. I didn't hear what he thought of me. I connected to what he was feeling, what he was needing. I absolutely love that clip from Marshall because he's so piercing with what he has to say and he's very intense. And I think sometimes I'm an intense person as well, so I can really connect in that way. But underneath that intensity, another thing that I'm really appreciating is how Marshall is able to lean into that conversation. He's being faced with a lot of anger which often means that people might shut down and want to get out of the situation. But instead, he was able to get curious about what's going on underneath this. What questions can I ask? And what I think, really, if Marshall was alive right now, I'd like to ask him about is how deeply rooted in love is this model, right? Because to be able to show up with someone who's showing up to you with you, towards you, with anger, is just an incredible feature to be able to do. And it's reminding me of a book that I'm reading right now. It's called Emergent Strategy by Adrienne Marie Brown. And it really connects this theme 
to deeply rooted love and how we can show up with one another and create better strategies that are for a win-win solution rather than the model of a win-lose, where I have to have power over you and you then have to have power over me. So she talks about imagining what it would look like if we're becoming more empathetic with one another, more vulnerable, and what that would do in shifting our relationships. So the model I want to talk about today is on nonviolent communication. And for this, there's just four easy steps. We start with the observation. And I'm asking folks to connect that to how we are feeling. And also reframing our relationship with um, feelings. Oftentimes, when we talk about this at the Gandhi Institute, that we are using Dr. Seuss' book language when it comes to our emotions. Mad, bad, glad, sad. And there's a plethora of other words that we can use to substitute in about what's going on for us. And those are really indicating, again, how we are doing and ties directly into the needs that are underlying that. So when it comes to our needs, what values are most important to us? And what are we, how are we contributing that into the world? Lastly, we talk about requests. So right now, I've been doing a lot of talking. Let's say I'm getting a little thirsty, and I might ask someone in the audience, do you mind if I have a glass of your water and have a little sip? And you might say, no. You might have germs I don't want to share with you, right? Now, if I'm giving a true request, that means I have to be OK with your answer and honoring that that answer is a no. Otherwise, and very critically to make that difference, otherwise I've just made a demand of you, right? So it's really important to look at the language of that. Also, if I just take your water. That creates a different type of conflict there. Two other little points to, to uh, connect into this framework is that our feelings are, informa are informing us whether our needs, those values are being met or unmet, and that every action that we are taking is in an attempt to meet a need. So me being here right now presenting this um, and thinking of the needs that come up, my need for a uh, sense of meaning and purpose in my life, my need for belonging and feeling a part of a community, if those needs are being met, which they are right now, I might be feeling pretty happy, right? I feel like baby pictures everyone gets excited about. You can't go wrong, right? And let's say I'm running out of time, and they cut off my mic and the lights go out, and um, my need for consideration, my need to be understood, those aren't met at that time. So maybe I'm looking a little like this. I think I perfected the eye roll by age two, right? So we can have these different emotions. We can have those also at the same time. We hear that, tears of joy. And so I want us, again, to just hone in and think about our relationship with um, emotions in a different way so that we can just see those as little indicators of how we are doing. Going back to this framework, I want to talk about an example that's really polarizing here in the US. I'm thinking about the example of the 2016 election. And prior to that, I want to just share about how it's the strategies in which we are, we are using that is causing conflict. We have these universal needs, and we have these universal feelings. But it's a strategy, again, if I take your water, or if I ask for a glass of water, or if I change my strategy, let's say I say, OK, you're not willing to share a cup of water with me right now. Could I use your cup of water after you're done? Would that work for you? Maybe that's the win-win solution, right? So I'm going to just quickly put up this observation of the 2016 election. And as that was coming up, I was feeling excited. I like to vote. This was going to be like my third uh, US president election that I could take part of. And as we got closer to that, I was also feeling a bit frustrated and scared because of the conversations that were happening, the candidates, the whole nine yards. And my needs were around belonging, a sense of security, hope for the future. So my request to folks was to get out and vote. And also, that's where some of the strategy in that conflict emerged. Because we saw people voting this way, and that way, and another way. And then some people who decided not to vote at all, and others who do not have the right to vote. 
So those are all the types of strategies that were being used. And again, that's where I want people to have their focus go to, instead of when we get back online, that we're seeing these different uh, conflicts in the comments, that we can hone in and say, what strategy, is this strategy of moving this to an online platform working? Or how can I invite this conversation to move to a place where we can have coffee, where we can have that face-to-face -face conversation? So a fun take-home assignment, if you would like, is that the next time you find yourself getting tense and finding yourself in a conflict, I invite you to think about what needs and feelings might be most alive for you. Thank you.